Okay. Welcome everyone to this evening's Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at MSU, formerly Wonderlust presentation, Animal Allies, History of Animals and Espionage. Ali at MSU presentations at the Belgrade Community Library are free and open to the public thanks to generous sponsorship the library received from Kenyon Noble Lumber and Hardware. If you have questions about other Ali at MSU programs or membership, please let me know and I'll get you connected with one of the Ali at MSU volunteers that are logged on tonight. My name is Sarah Creech and I am the Adult Services Librarian at the Belgrade Library. Before I introduce our presenter, a few Zoom tips and announcements. Attendee videos and microphones are both disabled for this, for this presentation. Questions will be taken using the chat and the raise hand functions. If you have a question you would like to ask live using your voice, click the raise hand button and at a natural stopping point during the presentation, I'll notify our presenter of a question and then allow you to speak. If you'd rather ask your question over chat, that's fine. I will ask it on your behalf using your first name. I will monitor and collect the questions that come in through the chat during the presentation. And I'll interrupt our speaker if the question is timely to the information currently being presented. The chat is also the location you can, or sorry, it's also where you can let me know if you're having technical issues. To use the chat, click the speech bubble at the bottom of your screen if you're on a laptop or a desktop. If there's no toolbar visible, press the Alt key one time. The chat will open on the right side of your screen if you're not in full screen mode. And if you are in full screen, it will appear in a window. You can move around your screen by clicking and dragging the top bar. To type your message, first open the chat, then click on the text that says type message here. Start typing and your message should appear where that type message here text was. To send, press enter or return. And I'll, I'll see it as soon as it's entered. Closed captioning, as you can see, is provided by the free PowerPoint captioning service. We are hopeful it will capture everything. This evening's event is being recorded for the library's YouTube channel and the Ali at MSU archive. You should receive a link with the recording when it's available on Ali's website. Finally, please take a minute to complete the survey that will pop up after the webinar ends. This survey helps the library and the sponsors know what programs bring the most interest and helps us improve every time. Also, since we cannot see your faces today, it helps us know if you enjoyed the presentation. So tonight's presenter is a former writing and literature instructor at Montana State University, as well as an MSU alumna. She is currently living in New York City and is therefore two hours ahead of us in the future, pursuing a master's degree in the Experimental Humanities Department at NYU. Her scholarly research focuses on espionage history and geopolitics in fiction and media, including the relationship the civilian public has with the world of the clandestine. Please give a warm, albeit silent, welcome to our presenter, Kelly Lewis. And it's now my pleasure to turn the presentation over to you, Kelly. Take it away. Hi, Sarah. Um, thanks again for inviting me. This is uh, the second talk that the Belgrade Public Library has kind of sponsored for me. Uh, I was a part of the Under a Scarlet Sky book panel last year before book panels in person weren't a thing anymore. Um, I am in the Big Apple, and so you might hear some background noise because I live in a neighborhood where drag racers frequently think that they have the best cars in the neighborhood, and I live only about 10 minutes away from LaGuardia Airport. So if there's any background noise, I apologize, but I can't do anything about it. Um, tonight, I'm going to walk down the clandestine corridors with you and invite you to get to know some of history's strangest and most effective super spies. Now, although we're used to our spies wearing ties and toting Tommy guns, there's a whole breed of them whose paws and claws we have used to our advantage over the decades. Tonight, you'll be meeting a small but not comprehensive menagerie of them. So alongside James Bond and Jason Bourne and all of those fancy JBs, there have been people with smaller, maybe heart-shaped dog tags. And those are the people that you'll be meeting, well, animals that you'll be meeting tonight. 
but they're no less agents than the ones that go around in tuxedos. First and foremost, because this is a factual talk, we have to talk in historical facts, which doesn't mean always representing the nicest parts of history. With animals in particular, animal mistreatment and death is a sensitive subject for a lot of people. And unfortunately, if we are talking historically and factually tonight, those topics are going to come up. However, because I understand that these are difficult subjects for people, I've made sure to visually cue people for when the slides and the topics that are being discussed in those slides involve animal misuse, abuse, or death. So to the right, you'll find that yellow stop sign is going to be an indicator that the slides are talking about any, any kind of animal misuse or abuse. And the red cross sign on the bottom will indicate a mention of animal death. Now, I'm not the kind of person that wants to talk about this more than I have to. So there will be no gory imagery, no exceedingly detailed photographs, no gruesome diagrams because that's just not the kind of talk that I want to have tonight. So all of these symbols are indicating is that I will mention in passing that these things happen. So if for your own health and safety, you need to mute yourself or step away from the presentation at any time, pay attention to those symbols because they will cue you for when you might need to step away. This is just a courtesy to all of you and knowing that even while a lot of this talk is hopefully going to be fun and ridiculous and interesting. Some of it is going to be serious and it is going to ask questions about the ethics of the way we use animals militarily in espionage and overall. So just be aware that those are two warnings that you can look for for the sake of your own health and safety. Now, moving on, let's talk about some very odd but unique recent espionage escapades with certain animals. Now, these aren't necessarily confirmed. They haven't necessarily been claimed as spies can be claimed uh, by any particular country or espionage agency, but I figured that they would be a fun place to start just to show that the ridiculous history of animals in espionage isn't quite dead yet. The first one uh, from 2007 was a case where, where two dozen squirrels were arrested in, uh, in Iran under the suspicion, not the confirmation, but the suspicion that they were decked out with eavesdropping uh, equipment. So if you can imagine squirrels with microphones, some kind of GPS device, maybe a little bulletproof vest, this was the, the idea that the Iranian uh, police force had in detaining these squirrels because they were worried that they were capturing intelligence on a particular building. Now, the, the picture that I featured is not in Iran. This is actually a picture that was taken relatively recently in New York of a squirrel making off with an entire New York sized slice of pizza, which if you know New York slices of pizza, that's not, that's, that's no mean feat. But, um, but maybe it proves that squirrels can harry, carry heavy intelligence equipment. Maybe they should. Or maybe they're just always up to things with their small little hands. The second example is uh, cats, as usual, being their sneaky selves. Uh, but both in Sri Lanka and in Russia, and multiple cases have come up in the last 20 years alone, so this is not an isolated incident, that cats bearing collars have made their way into prisons carrying, frankly, phenomenal amounts of drugs like really stunning amounts, the likes of which I didn't detail here. But they've carried meth, heroin, hash, and also they've carried SIM cards and even SD cards into prison. Why? Mm. <laughs> That's something that I'll leave to your imaginations. But um, they've obviously been detained or intercepted, I think is more the correct word. Uh, the last example that I'll give is a parrot that was arrested in Brazil and the drug cartel that said parrot was working for had trained it to in obviously in Brazilian Portuguese scream mom the police whenever beat cops or suspicious cars would be parked in the neighborhood around where the cartel was meeting. This was observed so often that it eventually tipped them off that the parrot 
was their kind of call warning signal. And there, thus the parrot was captured. It was hoped that the parrot would then give off names or even code names of people in the cartel. But as it turns out, uh, it wasn't no narc. The parrot <laughs> itself went totally silent after being put into custody. Now, the interesting part of this is that obviously the animals themselves were confiscated, arrested, trapped. You could use any number of verbiage for that. Um, but there's no like penal action ever taken against them because they're animals just doing as they've been told or trained more likely. So as far as any of us are aware, nothing has ever happened to these animals. They've just been idly taken off the streets and more or less rehoused. So it's just a brief place to start. These, all of these cases have occurred in the last 20 years. And espionage animal history goes far further back than that. Now, for the purpose of this talk and for some sense of organization, I've divided things into the three following categories of earth, water, and air. I wish I could have made an earth, wind, and fire joke, but we don't have any fire animals. It's not Pokemon, which is unfortunate because that would be really fun and cool. So we have to stick with what we've got, which is plenty of cool to pass around, I will say. So starting off, we're gonna talk about the two biggest and most infamous air guardians that we've ever employed. One of them, pigeons. You probably know about, you know them from every sidewalk you've ever tried to get down with any efficiency. And if you don't like birds, then they are your worst enemy. The other one, which has come out of a long tradition of eagling or birding, is uh, eagles and reconnaissance eagles specifically in the last half century. So for now, we're going to start with the original spy cams. Now, though aerial reconnaissance has been a part of our history for now more than a century because aerial reconnaissance began in World War I when we first, one, finally got planes right, and two, started using them in war uh, situations it brought out the importance of being able to see and map cities, war zones, battlefields from the air. Being able to do that mapping and that kind of cartography has continued to be proven useful, which in fact has led to the reason why we have so many uh, spy satellites today, is because they offer a very wide range of that same kind of aerial reconnaissance, only with less individual risk. Now, before we had the luxury of satellites, we had planes and birds. But planes, as was proven by multiple U-2 incidents throughout the Cold War, are rather easy to spot. In fact, they're kind of hard to ignore. If you grew up in Great Falls, Montana, which I did, you were very familiar with every platoon of planes that came into the neighborhood, including the F-16s that, uh, you could hear from a mile off and for a mile after they left. So planes aren't necessarily the best stealth way to acquire reconnaissance. But as it turns out, a more holistic and natural approach is, which is one of the reasons why pigeons have been used since World War I and even well into the 20th century. Now into the Cold War, you can see from these pictures that pigeons can carry a relatively decent amount of equipment on them. These pigeons are Cold War examples. And as was detailed in a video hosted by John Mendez, who was the former head of disguise for the CIA, these, we'll say equipment packages or backpacks, fanny packs, whatever, uh, were actually not as heavy as they look. In the Cold War, their total weight amassed to no more than 1.5 ounces, and that's battery, camera, and film. So they were very careful with how much they had the pigeons weighed down with, because the less they weighed them down, the more flight time they had. And during the Cold War, because this was still largely in the pre-digital era, pigeon reconnaissance footage was considered to be of higher quality and better use than the satellite footage at the time. So when you think about the history of reconnaissance, don't always think back to cameras as only being a digital medium. Very often they were attached to 
creatures like these who had better access and less noticeable access than any human might otherwise. Now I'm going to talk very briefly because this is a common misconception that the homing pigeon is an extinct species. And that's not true. There are two primary differences between homing and carrier pigeons, which I didn't even really know until I started researching this myself, but that carrier pigeons are every pigeon. In fact, carrier pigeons are mostly the decorative ones that you see at local fairs, the ones with like the really weird plumage that really don't carry anything other than said plumage anymore. But that homing pigeons are a breed of pigeon that is specifically trained for their endurance and their speed and their ability to navigate. So when the, someone says a carrier pigeon, that might be a pigeon that can carry something, but it's a very different style of training from what is considered a homing pigeon. And in World War I and well into World War II, sabotaging, or as the verbiage was, killing, wounding, or molesting <laughs> any kind of homing pigeon was considered an offense that could either get you court-martialed or jailed. So that was the importance of these birds to espionage throughout the entire last century. And yes, in spite of better judgment, they became starlets. They became a part of Hollywood myth. And as I grew up watching Stop That Pigeon, Dastard Lee and Muttley, which was a Hanna-Barbera production from 1969, they've just embedded themselves into a kind of animal mythos. They are, they are kind of a hero. We don't necessarily look at them on the street and think, ah, yes, you, you carried messages from the front in World War I. We don't think that when we look at pigeons. But overall, when we see them represented in war film, we understand their place, even to the point that a film in 2019 was made about them called Spies in Disguise. Now, one of the most infamous uh, runs of any singular pigeon was uh, Cher Ami, who in World War I delivered 12 messages in and out of the Ardennes. And in spite of having been wounded in the line of battle, delivered the final message that ultimately resulted in finding a lost regiment of soldiers. And that's specifically credited to one single pigeon. So arguably, <laughs> pigeons might have a better reputation for usefulness than most other starlets, or we'll say mm, film memes, tropes. Pigeons at least have earned their place on the Hollywood Boulevard, unlike some other people. Now, here's another addendum to our little strange vignette of crime animals earlier on in the presentation. So these markings on this bird's wings are actually inked tattoos. Now this bird was found in 2017 off the coast of Australia and it raised an investigation about why specifically with these markings this bird had been tattooed. And what they discovered and has since been proven true is that pigeons are being used for a new kind of Asian, like uh, Pacific Rim, we'll say gambling, and it's pigeon racing. And they don't just do it in small scale. These are overseas international races, and they'll tattoo their pigeons like you would put colors on a horse for, for the derby. And so they've had to engage in new 21st century investigations into a totally different kind of uh, gambling circuit around various Asian countries, including Taiwan. And while that seem, might seem far-fetched, uh, the longest recorded flight for a homing pigeon was over 1,800 miles. So it was almost, it would, and in metric, it was almost 3,000 kilometers. It was that long. So if you doubt that pigeons can carry messages for really obscenely long, long distances, uh, here's your reminder to reconsider. All right, the second example from the aerial point of view, as it were, are a brand spanking new military trend brought around by drones. Now, if you've been a longer for, alive longer for more than 15 years, 
you remember early drones and how cute and easily blown around they were by any kind of wind. Now drones have gotten a lot more sturdy, we'll say, and a lot more able to navigate weather conditions and very extreme terrain. This has been being used by terrorist groups and also insurgent groups. So a lot of militaries have gotten very spiky, shall we say, about the capacity of unknown people to surveil and, con and conduct reconnaissance just with drones that realistically you can buy on a standard commercial market these days. What some militaries, meaning the Danish and the French militaries have started doing in response to this, is training eagling units. Now eagling is a very ancient, very well established uh, relationship between man and animal, but one that has been only very recently revived for the purpose of military use. Now the reason why they're choosing eagles is because not only are they highly adapted to dealing with high altitude flight, high altitude attack, and just overall high speed wind conditions, they're exceedingly good at taking down drones that otherwise really don't have any other defense other than being in the air too high for anything else to reach. Most drones can't even match the height that most eagles fly at. And as this eagle even shows right here, the French military has been designing equipment that helps the eagles not get hurt when they take drones down. So making them itty bitty gloves so they don't get their feet or talons damaged when they grab the rotors that run the drone. Um, the Danish military has downsized their particular unit, but the French military has continued to develop theirs even to the point of adding helmets for their eagles to make sure that they're not hurt in any kind of concussive explosion caused by a downed drone. Now, this reestablishment of an old tradition is cool and kind of chummy, but there's a different angle to things that I want to bring to your attention, which is while drones are bringing in great perspectives on aerial, aerial reconnaissance, GoPro has also done some very strange things to the zoological research field. This video here that I'm about to show you is done by a particular group of research uh, initiatives that are using GoPro footage from Eagleback to map glaciation and especially the degrade of glaciation in the Swiss Alps but they've also used it to raise ecological awareness about eagle habitat, eagle behavior, and stuff like that. This video was filmed in 2015, and it's launching an eagle from the top of the Burj Khalifa, which is still to date the tallest building in the world located in Dubai. So it's only about two minutes, and I'll let you watch it here. It doesn't really have any sound, so I'm not going to bother to turn it on. Um, but I want you to be thinking, not just from an ecological perspective when you watch this, I want you to be thinking in terms of a spy. I want you to be looking at the ground and what you can see about it from this very short clip. And with that, I'm just going to play the clip.
Obviously, if that reconnaissance footage had been handed to someone more than a century ago, they would have approximately lost their minds. So part of the reason why I'm bringing this to your attention is because a lot of our understanding of reconnaissance and just ability to access distant regions comes from technology that is less than 30 years old. Most of these animal allies that we're talking about tonight have been used for longer than the technologies that we have invented to replace them, which places a very interesting emphasis on our reliance on animals up to this point, and also the ways in which we can and possibly should replace them with technology so that we're not necessarily using these animals to our own advantage. So that's the end of the aerial unit. Oh, whoops. And now we're going to move into the earthbound. And so out of the skies and onto the ground, we're going to move into more familiar territory, probably for most of you who have ever, I don't know, been around a horse or own a dog. So first I'm gonna be talking about horses and about the history of the cavalry, which largely is militarily based, but horses for a very long, very long part of our history have been involved not only in army, uh, army and military uses, but in war and espionage as well. So horses have recordedly been being used by us for more than 5,000 years. And they've been being buried alongside warriors for mm, now maybe upwards of 4,000 years, which tells about how much we've used them in the past. You also have to remember that prior to 1804, which was when the first train was ever built, the only way of getting around was hoofing it yourself or riding something. So that horses have been a huge part of military history and espionage history is not necessarily so unthinkable, I would like to argue. Largely, uh, horses were used for pretty much everything, especially in wartime reconnaissance, transport, supply, attack, anything that a horse could bring you, it would. And anything they could find to get to you was probably brought by horsepack prior to about 1930. Okay, so note the warnings on the upper left-hand corner. If you need to stop or step away, I am going to talk about some early biological warfare here. So in World War I, uh, this, and this was here in the United States, this was actually in New York, there was an absolute outbreak of glandrous bacteria in horses that were being sent to the front in Europe. So before they could even leave North America, they were being, as it turned out, injected with the Brucolderia malei bacterium, which is a bacteria that's not fatal to humans, but is very fatal to horses and similar species, specifically for the purpose by the German agent Anton Dilger of impacting how quickly the Allies could get resources and cavalry to both the East and Western fronts. This places an emphasis, especially in 1915 when this occurred, on the importance of horses to military tactics. If the correct number of horses couldn't get to a certain region, it wasn't just that they couldn't do cavalry charges. It was that they couldn't haul munitions, they couldn't haul in medical supplies or food, they couldn't haul soldiers. So the cavalry wasn't just an attack force, it was the backbone of what we now know as a modern supply chain, especially because this was well before the deployment of heavy artillery vehicles like jeeps, tanks, just general army vehicles, as was more emphasized in World War II. And actually from World War I onward, it did mark the end of the cavalry era, not just because of just general advancements in mechanical technologies, but because the advancement of guns in World War I specifically proved that the cavalry was no longer a viable means of charging one's enemies. The chances of losing more soldiers and horses in a cavalry charge increased with the specific invention of the Tommy gun, so the modern machine gun and quick fire artillery. Not only that, but where horses used to be the only resource for people to go into clandestine areas or enemy territory and gather intelligence or reconnaissance, they were quickly replaced in World War I by the plane. 
Planes were emphasized in this period because they could get in and out of areas considerably quicker than most horses. They could view from above and get better cartographic information quicker. And more likely, they weren't as liable to be shot down until the enemy started building planes of their own. But even throughout World War I, the cavalry started being scaled back in favor of jeeps, tanks, all-terrain military vehicles, and also increased uh, improvement in wartime rail lines. So while horses were still used very frequently to especially take supplies into regions that were impossible to reach by modern vehicle, they kind of were phased out and were phased in instead by uh, ground cavalry and air cavalry units. Now, most horse infantry or army horses are typically for show, but not all of them. In 2001, there was a specific operation conducted during Enduring Freedom that required a unit of Marines to be dropped into a specific area that was so mountainous that it was too dangerous and too compact to have any modern and 2001 modern uh, all-terrain vehicles manage the terrain. And so this unit recommandeered an entire set of horses, an entire mini cavalry specifically for this one mission. So after mm, the Philippines, roughly in 1946, the cavalry really wasn't used anymore and horse usage in the, in the military went way down. But even in, as of 2001, horses were vital for getting military and infantrymen into an area that otherwise couldn't be reached. Which sounds like espionage to me, but that's just me. All right, now for man's best friend. And maybe the enemy of my enemy is my friend, but also maybe my enemy's best friend is my friend when it's his dog. Now, dogs have almost almost as extensive a military history as, as horses, but dogs by and large weren't implemented militarily um, until a little bit later. So in 600 BC, which again, not as far back as horses, um, the first recorded successful training of uh, any kind of paramilitary dog training was successful in Lydia, which was in um, Asia Minor at the time. Uh, recorded that a tribe had trained a group of war dogs to ward off invaders that succeeded. So they've been around for an equally long time and we've known about dogs positive traits, their sense of smell, their sense of loyalty, their ability to go with us into rugged terrain and just their ability to survive. It's one of the primary reasons why they think we domesticated dogs in the first place. Um, those uses have continued to hold true because today, as many police and military dogs have proven, they're still used to detect explosives, gases, chemical agents, and they're still used on scouting and reconnaissance missions. Uniquely, uh, between the Army and the Marines, especially in the 1950s when they started specifically recruiting dogs, uh, they pared it down to a list of seven breeds that they prefer to use for their field usage. And these are the German Shepherd, the Doberman Pinscher, the Belgian Sheepdog, the Siberian Husky, the Malamute, and the Eskimo Dog. Not entirely sure what difference the Eskimo Dog is from the previous two, but I assume that the Navy knows. Um, but that interestingly enough, in the modern day, Many of the similar breeds are still being used, but we've branched out a little bit. Um, but dogs are currently being outfitted with very high-tech remote-controlled camera equipment, and that dogs are one of the few species that, if they're found with incriminating equipment, can be charged actively with espionage. So not just like the squirrels that they thought might have been spying on people. Dogs can actually be held and if they find out where the equipment is from, they can be held like officers can be held as prisoners of war. So there's an interesting tidbit and how valuable dogs are to us. Now, I'll warn again, this is one of those slides where we are going to talk about specific 
planned animal death. But this is one of those instances where what we've chosen to do historically needs to be addressed and definitely deserves to be known. So the first country that spearheaded a tank dog division, or I guess anti-tank dog division, was Russia. And as early as 1935, they had started training military dogs as a part of their standard military operations. Or I, I'm sorry, as soon as 1924. By 1935, the dogs were included as a part of the Workers and Peasants Red Army. So they were, they were official army personnel. Now they had uh, opened 13 dog training facilities over this period and three of those facilities were specifically devoted to training anti-tank dog personnel. Initially, the dogs were given detachable explosive charges that they were trained to leave in the wake of certain kinds of tanks. They would do this by training the dogs to look for tanks and train them based on what the fuel smelled like. So they were using relatively solid dog training methods, albeit trial and error. Um, but when the delivery method wasn't efficient enough, they decided to go with something a little more fatalistic. And I don't necessarily have to go into detail about this, but they decided that giving the dogs detachable bombs was not sufficient and was not efficient. The alternative was unfortunately being willing to sacrifice the animal. Now, the US and Japan at times tried this method for themselves. Both countries decided very shortly after World War II that it was not conducive and was not overall effective. Russia continued to use this method and even until 1996, they were known to keep dogs trained in this method and didn't shut down the division entirely until 1996. The reason why I'm emphasizing this is because that's very late in the 20th century, where most other countries had given up on this method more than 60 years prior. So that says something about the choices that this particular division was willing to make. All right, on to our next terrestrial uh, ally, which is one that I'm particularly not fond of because I don't like bugs. But I'm going to talk about them anyway because they've turned out to be useful somehow. Largely by becoming cyborgs. So the next time you see a roach and maybe some slightly large beetle, just make sure it doesn't have like a microchip on the back. If it doesn't, you still have all right to squish it or safely re relocate it outside. Um, but maybe also if it has a microchip, catch it and make sure to ask why it's in your house. Um, but nowadays, a lot of successful science has been put toward creating these unusual cyborgs. As it turns out, larger uh, insects such as large beetles and cockroaches are able to be reprogrammed by tapping into their antennae. And while this sounds very <laughs> dystopian and creepy and absolutely has terrifying espionage connotations, the primary use that they're being geared toward is actually tapping into their use in emergency situations. So thinking about building collapses, train collapses, even mine collapses. It's very difficult to get camera equipment or sonar equipment to a scene fast enough to get people out of certain kinds of rubble. Bugs, however, especially bugs of this size, have no issue navigating crevices that are too small for any modern equipment to get through. So largely the purpose of these bugs is being geared toward emergency service relief. That does not preclude them from being used for more nefarious purposes. Now, this is just a, a brief, fun media reference, but that they've also been referenced in something as late as the X-Files, also in the 1990s, where they posited that this technology would become real, that modern robotics would advance to the point that it could create robots that were as small as bugs, which we're almost there, but not quite. But that for the time being, we have found a way to hijack 
the nervous system of certain insects in order to navigate them where we want them to go. It's also at this point more conducive to that usage to use the actual bugs because creating parts that create the same mechanical movement as as bugs at that size is very prohibitive at this point not far away but as yet still relatively prohibitive and this one's just for kicks and giggles so um i don't know how many of you probably at least some have met an emu at one point in your life they're terrifying. They're large and angry and look like they're willing to just mess up your entire day. Australia, especially, has a long history, and I mean more than four decades, of losing an uphill battle against the emu. Now, it's become an internet meme, but the Great Emu War was more like a set of Great Emu Wars. And over the years, from 1929 up until 1950, the Australian government was dealing with massive migrational populations of emu destroying farmland. And the farmers in Australia, rather like Montana, were getting tired of it, especially because once the damage the emus caused was done, other invasive species could also get into those agricultural lands. And so they decided that they would battle against the invasive, invasive emu. And they lost a lot. For as much ammunition was issued, very few of the tens of thousands of emus that migrate into, migrated into those areas during that time period were actually hurt, let alone killed. Some of them were, which is historically documented. But overall, the, the emus won. The humans, who, again, emphasizing this against the usefulness of cavalry, the humans with machine guns lost against the oversized fluffy dinosaurs. And I think that the real espionage mystery here is what did the emus have? What was their plan? What was their strategy for really just being able to defeat the people with far superior weaponry? I'm curious about that. I feel like there's some kind of scheme back there. All right, moving on from our terrestrial friends to our oceanic allies. Now, the two primary examples, again, there are others, are beluga whales and dolphins which sounds kind of sea world and you can wag your hand at that. And I don't blame you until you learn better. Now, this case is from 2019, but its history goes back far further than that. But in 2019, in a small Norwegian town, their port became frequented by this beluga whale who was wearing a GoPro harness. And it turned out that this beluga whale was very friendly and very, very comfortable around people. Obviously to a point where it was a trained behavior and not a naturally occurring behavior. The whale would come into the bay, it would retrieve toys, so diving toys that were thrown out for it off the docks. It even at one point retrieved a dropped cell phone. So it had trained behaviors that were definitely not natural for any kind of wild animal of the kind. Now, while militarily it was decided that dolphins were definitely more useful than beluga whales or other kind, others of their kind, this visitor raised some unusual questions, especially because of the accessories. Now, while the clasp itself said St. Petersburg it wasn't in Cyrillic, so it might have come from an American source, but overall its behavior matched other reports of trained beluga whales in the Baltic Sea. Not necessarily American trained, mind. Many of the Norwegian Navy or shore guard were relatively sure that it had been trained in Russia. Russia largely because they have and, or had and 
probably have a research facility in Murmansk, Murmansk pardon me, um, that up until the 1990s was perfectly functional and used to train their own uh, marine mammal unit, which included dolphins and other creatures, including beluga whales. Now, it was supposedly shuttered in the 1990s, but given the Russian Ministry of Defense was buying cetaceans in 2014, according to their own budget documents, it seems more likely that the Murmansk uh, facility is reopened and that that initiative never actually closed. So the reason why the beluga whale was also raising so many eyebrows is because it was also very comfortable with being close to ships, including fishing boats. Now, that wouldn't be alarming if it wasn't for the fact that this radio harness, if it could hold a GoPro, it could easily hold lightweight underwater equipment that could tap into small boat telemetry and GPS. And if it can do that, it also has access to other locational uh, or I guess other radio locations of ships, boats, or submarines in the area. So, so the beluga whale was a plot twist and definitely a plot twist from an age that we thought was behind us, but it turned out was maybe not as far back as we thought. And now onto dolphins who are arguably the much scarier uh, other half of this strange underwater marriage. Now, uh, dolphins are obviously highly intelligent. They've been well documented for this. Many, many research projects have undergone IQ tests to try and understand just how intelligent dolphins can get. So has the military. And the military has found out that they are essentially fabulous undersea soldiers. Um, they're incredibly competent minesweepers, which is a terrifying concept for most humans, let alone doing it underwater. Um, and they're also just beefy. They're very good at bullying people into being where they're supposed to be versus where they're not supposed to be. This image here uh, is of K-Dog, which is the name of the dolphin, by the way, uh, wearing a pinger, so a radar pinger, um, and performing underwater minesweeping duties during the Iraq war in the Persian Gulf. So these are very serious parts of our military even to this day. So I'll talk a little bit about their minesweeping duties. We first kind of got this very seemingly harebrained idea in the Vietnam War. And also in that war specifically, we were dealing with a lot of uh, naval espionage and the placement of underwater mines. Um, but the other reason that we started using dolphins and, and uh, our own undersea allies was because they're not just good for finding mines, they're good for defending ships. And not just ships, but naval installations. So for our nuclear submarines, they tend to be in bays, but that are ocean accessible because we have to let the, nat the natural tide water in and out. The problem is, is that if you let water in and out, stuff can get in and out in that water. And we started recruiting dolphins and training them to recognize unfamiliar divers because especially atomic submarine espionage was very common in the Cold War. And how do you defend yourself against a diver underwater that you can't see? And our solution was to, I won't say hire, because that's not an ethical reflection of the choice. We did choose to train dolphins to recognize unfamiliar divers and to beat them up, essentially. <laughs> and they turned out to be very good at it. They're also highly spatially aware underwater. They can detect electromagnetic fields. And so they're especially well attuned to finding underwater mines in ways that humans are not and is way more dangerous to human divers than it is to even trained dolphins. Um, the marine, the military marine mammals unit is based out of San Diego, California and is still active to this day. As of 2019, we have 70 enlisted, highly trained dolphins who 
know how to look for lost ships. They know how to do search and rescue. And they know how to keep people out of where they're supposed to be. Which I can't say answers questions about why wild dolphins are so good about beating people up. But maybe they're not wild dolphins after all. Maybe they're just not in uniform. Who knows? All right. So with Sarah's help, we're going to do a little bit of trivia here, just for a light way to round out the last half hour of you listening to me yak. So what we're going to do is this is a quiz show, a very uh -huh. brief quiz show called Fly or Fail. It's so all you have to do, Sarah will put up essentially what is a yes or no question. Is this animal, based on your guess, a fly, meaning yes, it's a good spy, they're totally fly, or are they a fail? As in they would absolutely fail in the field, please never let them out of the house. So there are three questions, but we're gonna go through them one at a time. And so for the first one, we're going to start with cats. You'll have 30 seconds to answer the following quiz. So say yes or no, we'll tally the results and then you'll get your answer. All right, so you should have, all right, answers are coming in, we're doing well. What's your opinion? Spy or no spy? <laughs> About half the people logged on have voted. Kelly, did you vote? No, oh, I mean, I feel like that's cheating. You're but... allowed to vote. <laughs> okay. Okay. We're still getting some votes. We'll leave it up for a full minute because that's okay. so 15 more seconds. You're one of the 13 people who haven't voted. Now's your chance. Speak now or forever. Fly or fail, fly or fail. All right. And that's a minute. So you ready to see the results? I'm very curious. Oh, okay. All so 36% right. of you think it's a fly and 64 think it's a fail. For cats. For cats. Now I'm very sorry for all you cat lovers out there, but cats are absolutely a fail. Uh, in spite of the drug smugglers at the beginning of the presentation, uh, every intelligence agency that has attempted to train cats has not succeeded, <laughs> which if any of you own cats, I would guess should not be surprised because they are trainable when they feel like it. <laughs> Um, frankly, I'm amazed in Sri Lanka and Russia that they knew how to train cats. I think that maybe that's their own secret service. Um, on top of that, though, the history of trying to train cats for espionage is longer than like the internet clickbait articles that have been circulating in the last few years about Acoustic Kitty or Operation Acoustic Kitty. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But prior to Acoustic Kitty, both the US and the Russian military services had tried to plant microphones on cats, like in their collars, to try and get them to get field surveillance or any kind of audio. Because if a cat's in the room, people are just going to say what they're going to say. It's just a cat. It's fine. Um, the problem was that if any, if the, essentially if the cat wasn't hairless, the microphones would catch all of the static off of the fur, just the movement of the fur in and of itself would cause all this distortion in the microphone. The other problem is that if the cat started purring, the audio was completely useless. So that led them into what became Operation Acoustic Kitty. And Again, watch the warnings. So this is as, as gruesome as the diagram as I get, but this is just a general idea because they decided, well, since we can't just put it on the collar, let's put it in the animal, which by and large is a bad plan. If your last plan is to have to implant an animal with something, it's a bad plan. Now, with the Acoustic Kitty, the, the idea was to have an antenna wire, a microphone, and a transmitter. 
that they could pick up the audio directly from somewhere else. The thing that is largely misconstrued in many of the articles on the internet was that Acoustic Kitty, upon being released into the wild, was immediately unearthed or unalived. But, uh, but according to one of the agent runners who went on the record in 2013, those rumors were largely unfounded and that the cat did go out and have a trial run, was recovered, brought back in, had the equipment removed, and then lived a happy life ever after. Now, typically, spies aren't very touchy-feely. And so that some of the, one of the persons involved with the project saying that the cat lived leads me to believe that the cat did probably live. Nonetheless, this project in the 60s was pretty much shut down entirely by 1967 because it just had no success. Using cats, at least in a very strategic kind of way of sending them into buildings to record voices was a total botched effort and was, as far as we know, not ever repeated or continued. All right. And so, yes, we can be sure that both Blofeld and, is it me, Mini-Me? I know that Mini-Me is the little one. Um, in any case, Dr. they were both, neither Dr. of the cats Evil. had radio equipment installed, probably. <laughs> I, think, I think both of them would know better by that point. All right, round two, okay. sea lions. Ready? Your voting options will appear shortly. So what do you think? Fly or fail? Sea lions. Okay, votes are coming in. Well, this is interesting to watch. <laughs> And we'll give you 10 more seconds. Most everyone has voted and Jerry, I do see your vote in the chat. So I'll mention that as well. All right. We have one more for fail. So okay. 15 to 12. Okay. Count. So, so most of you think fly and it, this is pretty close. I would, so I would say like 59, 41. Yeah. Right. Okay. So 59 say fly and 41 say fail. It is an absolute fly. Now, really? <laughs> yes. Now you might be going like clap, clap, art, art, seals, really? Uh, the answer is yes. And the resume is as follows. So as is kind of evidenced by SeaWorld and a lot of aquariums, seals are easily trainable. And they actually have a very good sense of differentiating between like a trainer or a familiar person and someone that they don't know or don't trust, which in espionage situations out in the field is a very important skill. Sea lions are very naturally adept at making that distinction. Um, their bite force is off the chain, which I will talk about more in just a second. Um, they're also naturally occurring and very inconspicuous. If you just see like seals like hanging out anywhere, you're just gonna go off. Oh, it's some seals, which is the perfect cover story. They also do have exceptional underwater eyesight, even better than dolphins. So their ability to navigate, especially at deep depths, is, is better than most because they don't, they don't necessarily use sonar, but their visual contact is way better than most. Um, it also turns out that like Komodo dragons, getting bitten by one is not a good time because they have a particular bacteria in their mouths that causes nasty infection. So don't get bitten by seals, ladies and gentlemen. Don't become a frog man and try to sneak in to nuclear submarine facilities. <laughs> On top of the reasons why all of that is a bad idea, you could get bitten by a seal and never recover. And that's just shameful. Now, the thing is that James Bond got this one right which is the thing that I don't know how to process and I don't know if I ever will. Granted, this was the very comical 1967 
Casino Royale movie, which was not officially licensed by James Bond, but because Casino Royale was independently owned at that time, they could just make it into a total farce. Like, actually, this Casino Royale movie came well before Austin Powers or Kingsman or any of the early comedies. It was the first Bond movie to make fun of Bond, and it was a Bond film. And in the final climax scene, it includes this seal, who is also Agent 007, sitting at the bar, clapping as people shoot each other, which seems the very appropriate thing to do. And as I mentioned before, uh, the San Diego unit also does include 30 trained sea lions. To the best of our knowledge, though, they don't know how to make martinis. Now, onto the actual like pedigree of why sea lions actually <laughs> kind of scare me the most out of pretty much any of the animals on this list is because while dolphins are very aggressive and very capable at their jobs, sea lions as evidenced by this picture, can just mow down through the middle of a sturgeon. That means that their bite force is really kind of truly incredible. And you can see from the skull that I placed on the left that their jaws are really well inclined to nomming things. I don't want to be ever one of those things that they decide to bite. Um, but one of the reasons why they were specifically recruited wasn't just because of their trainability alongside dolphins, but because, and this was evidenced by uh, both our research and Russian naval research, was that their bite force is strong enough to puncture aqua lungs. So scuba tanks, they can just bite them and pop them. And they can just dismember divers if they want to. They don't really eat people as a standard, but as the, as the puppies of the ocean, they can also be the attack dogs of the ocean and they have very powerful jaws to prove it. So reason number a thousand why you don't want to get bitten by a sea lion is because you probably won't walk away. All right, trivia number three. Final one, sharks, fly or fail? I think everybody who has been participating has, so we're going to end it. And here are the results. Okay. <laughs> you guys are learning. I'm so proud of you. So 27% said fly and 73% said fail. I'm very proud to say that 73% of you were correct and that sharks are an absolute fail. In spite of them being featured so often, so often in spy movies, sharks are just not, not the place to look for something like trainable. Um, for their resume, they're largely like completely untrainable. You, the only thing you can rely on is that if a shark is hungry, it will eat something or it will try anyway. If it's also curious, it might eat something. That's, that's the range of their mental capacity. Hungry? Eat. Curious about something. Might also accidentally eat. Not, not a good vector of intelligence there. Um, secondarily, large and the especially like aggressive and carnivorous breeds do not survive well in captivity. So great white sharks, absolutely not. Larger hammerheads, no. Bull sharks, no. Tiger sharks, no. The only really large breed, like large, large breed of shark they can keep in captivity and in enclosures are whale sharks, and those are not carnivorous species. Um, they're also geographically really inconsistent. So the same sharks that might be there sometimes of the year might not be in the area other times of the year, so they're not reliable. They're also hugely migratory, and their migration patterns still are not well understood. So interfering and tampering with that migration pattern disrupts their life cycle and just overall makes them very hard to rely on even from a naturally occurring standpoint. Now 
Bond obviously got this one wrong, which everyone can sigh, <laughs> sigh about because thank goodness. But there was a script that Sean Connery himself featured in this photo, so cutely smiling at a sand tiger shark that really wants to get a piece of that, which I understand. He was, he was looking good back then. Don't blame me, sand tiger shark. Um, but he helped write a script that revolved around a robotic shark carrying nuclear weapons that Bond would have to follow to the Caribbean. Poor thing. Poor guy. And, uh, and duel to the death underwater with this robot shark carrying nukes. This was a legitimate script that thankfully was scrapped um, and largely illegally <laughs> cannibalized and aspects of it were in fact adapted into the 1965 James Bond movie called Thunderball. Um, now, thank goodness the, the robo nuke shark didn't happen, but some people still get bright ideas like us, because in 2006, the US Department of Defense decided that it was gonna try to perform surgery on big sharks so that it could put implants in their brains and they could pick up all kinds of electrical fields and chemical trails, which in theory is a good idea because sharks have very, like the ampullae of Lorenzini, which are on the snout of the shark carry very, very dynamic and sensitive nerves, which pick up chemical and electrical balances in the water. It's one of the ways that they navigate to prey to each other, the ocean in general, we don't know. So, and on the other hand, sharks' brains are relatively simple. It is swim, eat, make more shark when available. And that's about it. Theoretically, that should have worked, except for the fact that I mentioned on the last slide, which is sharks notoriously don't do well in captivity. captivity. They really would not do well with invasive surgery. Even when tagging great white sharks in the field, even the best you know, marine biologists have to be exceedingly careful about how long they handle large sharks for because of how much it can mess with and potentially kill them. So the idea that the Department of Defense was like, yeah, we're just gonna kidnap some sharks and put stuff in their brains is not a thing. <laughs> and thankfully since 2006, nothing has come of it, except a better idea. Now, obviously the, the image on the left is the original Bruce mechanism from the Jaws movie. And on the right, you have the Navy's ghost swimmer shark robot. One of these does not look like the other, largely because the other one, the one on the right, looks very realistic, strangely. So this is a very recent development by the US Navy and this robot drone shark, they are planning on using for undersea intelligence gathering but overall, they have found that because of the way they've programmed it to move in the way that they've designed it, it interferes with the natural undersea order much less than even sending down mini submarines, sending down divers. It's a surprisingly effective prototype that also doesn't involve brain surgery on endangered sharks. So that's something. But this, this robot in particular brings me to my next slide, which is a kind of a growing trend and where we seem to be handing off the need to always rely on animals to gather the intelligence that we can't gather ourselves. And, but it's not just replacing them with satellites or with bigger you know, warships with better antenna arrays. Some of it is involved in a robotics building process called, my, called biomimicry. And it is exactly what it sounds like on the tin. Biomimicry mimics the biology. And this is being used across the board, both for civilian ecological research and biological research and with Ghost Swimmer for military usage. So a couple of the best cutting edge examples that I've been able to find were, as you see on the left, hummingbirds, this drone, was specifically designed to mimic the sound, vibration, wavelength, and shape of a hummingbird. Because hummingbirds are herbivores, they largely just 
eat, you know, do, well not do, but um, pollen, the goopy version. And so their presence doesn't immediately bother insects around them. And so these drones have been being used to study entomological migration patterns. So as you see in the picture, it's being used to take very detailed at, out of the, the camera in its chest, which you can just barely see, uh, it's being used to capture footage of monarch butterflies because it they don't react to its presence because it's functioning in the biome as a hummingbird would function. And so they're not disturbed by it. Likewise, Ghost Swimmer, while right now it's being designed and used for military usage, it's very possible that it could be used for actual shark research in the future as well. Now, granted, sharks are pretty cannibalistic and monchy, so Ghost Swimmer will probably have more than a couple uh, fatalized brethren if it does get implemented for that. But overall, it can be used for reef research, re reef ecology, and just oceanic understanding of migrational patterns. So it, it could very well have some civilian uses as well. The last one on the right comes from the BBC series Spy in the Wild, which used a series of more or less accurate uh, robots. In this case, the one that is featured is the pup of an African wild dog. And they would put these out into the wild and see how the natural populations would respond to an abandoned young. And so get visual insights into how the populations reacted and into how the animals reacted. And the series in and of itself was a resounding success and proved that there's a lot of ecological research that can be done this way without the presence of humans always needing to be present in order to record these interactions, which in the past has caused a lot of time and effort to be put into recording animals in their natural habitat because they don't feel natural when humans are around. And so Spies, Spy in the Wild was a series that definitely prodded that, that boundary of what what the absence of humans could allow for ecological research. So some of espionage building is leading into this and some of it is leading away. It's hard to tell how things are going to go. So throughout the largeness of this talk, which thank you very much for sticking tight and buckling in, um, the two main quandaries that I, I met as I was researching this, this is, is our use historically and presently of animals in espionage, in the military, in police forces, is it ethical? And ethical is such a big word that I can't even really tell you what I mean by it, because I don't know. It's, it's a big question of, of how the, the way we treat animals, the way we use them, the dangers that we put them in, are they worth the ends as the means. So that's what I want to ask because I want to ask you because I don't necessarily know and I'd like to know what you think. The second question is, is regarding this move toward biomimicry and is that better ecological stewardship on our part? Is that helping decrease the impact that we have when we try to understand our world or is it moving into weird 1984 territory where we have eyes on everything, even at the bottom of the ocean, which granted feels very scary and weird, as it should. So what are your thoughts on our move toward biomimicry and the advancement of even cyborg bugs and this kind of robotics technology? And so I have uh, two pages of sources and links for you that I don't expect you to read fast paced. So I'm skipping them. And uh, thank you. That is all that I have. And the floor is now open for questions moderated via Sarah. And hopefully that is not too early to stop. Not at all. It's um, 7.18 and Colleen says, thanks, interesting project. We don't have any questions right now, but I would, also be interested in hearing, you know, people's answers to your questions. So if you have a, a response and you want to share it, please do. We'd love to start a, a short conversation if there are no questions. 
Pamela says, um, thank you, that was delightful. Oh, and then um, D West says unethical. And um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. I love this pigeon <laughs> so much. <laughs> Um, also, if anyone thinks that birds are real, I'm seriously in crisis. Like, I, I don't know anymore. Yes. What was it? It was, yes, around um, downtown Bozeman these days, I see those stickers that are like, pigeons aren't real, they're government spies. <laughs> Honestly, having moved to New York and just the audacity of some of the pigeons here, where you're like, I'm literally going to step on you. And the pigeons just like, I do it do it <laughs> and i can't and so the pigeon wins and i'm like that's got to be some ballsy fbi agent that's like mm. yeah they're yeah. watching you yeah i'm like oh that's weird <laughs> um also donna west yeah i i would agree i i think that's one of the yeah the primary things that i grappled with especially with how disposable historically we've treated animals and this goes for horses and birds and dogs and cats and and just how many animals we've used over the years that did we need to or were they a convenient solution that we used instead of coming up with a solution that didn't require animals that that was the entire source of the question yeah yeah Donna, I, yeah i would absolutely other means. agree Donna, for sure Donna said uh we can use other means to develop things that spy. I agree, like that biomimicry you were talking mm -hmm. about. Steve says, ethics, I think it depends on the natural tendency of the animal. Dogs, for instance, are known for being protective, sending it after a tank with a live bomb. No. Yeah, um, I'd also say to Steve Hampel, thank you for the correction. The word sugar nectar was not in my brain at the time. It yes. was just not there. Goopy pollen. I think that's a goopy pollen. <laughs> yes. So sorry for that inaccuracy. Also, uh, Mr. Grout. Yeah, I would agree. Um, again, I, I think with some dogs, uh, some service roles suit them really well. Um, but yeah, but especially the 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 anti tank explosive care. It's also kind of like sending a dog up in a satellite. Or, or a rocket knowing that the dog won't survive re-entry into the atmosphere. That's a that's an early cosmonaut example that I, I'm not cool with. Yeah. But we did it. Yeah. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Um, let's see. See. <laughs> Would you like to expand, Jerry, on your C? On the C. <laughs> Colleen says, are there monkey examples? There was a news story about uh, monkeys yeah. trained to steal recently. Yes, um, I, I didn't read about the monkeys trained to steal, but I did read an article while I was doing this. So again, this was a this is just a small collection that I could fit into an hour and a half. It's not the whole story by any means. Um, but I did read an article while doing this research on monkeys that in um, Kathmandu, I wanna say, had learned or been trained to steal wallets and mopeds, drive said mopeds um, safely, which I don't like, uh, but they would steal wallets and then make you barter with them to give the wallet back. So you had to give them like food or something that they wanted before they would give the wallet back. Like there are multiple reported occasions of this. So there are absolutely uh, monkey examples. I just, I also selfishly, I will fess up. I, I find monkeys very disturbing. And so I don't like talking about how smart they are. And that's, that's a me thing. That's, that's a research fault on my point, but it, but I'm not saying that it doesn't happen because it definitely does. Um, I don't necessarily know of any like institutionalized usage but I don't doubt that it's happened. Fair. Steve um, says, what's your background that got you into this topic? I'll, I'll share a little bit of how I met Kelly. Yeah. Um, she mentioned earlier at the beginning of the talk that she gave, she was part of a panel on um, 
our one book Belgrade pick last year. It was actually the first year we had a community read in Belgrade. And um, I asked her to speak on writing espionage fiction because the book Beneath a Scarlet Sky was about a spy in World War II Italy, um, an Italian spy spying on the Nazis. Um, very, very good book. If you have read it or I recommend it, local author Mark Sullivan wrote it. Um, he's a very big library advocate. So I found Kelly through MSU's website, just like looking for something about writing. And it was like, oh my gosh, espionage fiction, that's perfect. And through this panel, she talked about spy, like espionage and just like everything that goes into it. So we had a conversation afterwards and she mentioned how many animals are used in espionage. And it was kind of like that bug in the back of my brain where it was like, I need to talk to Kelly again. We need to do this talk. So that's how I met her and, and got her to do this talk. So I'm very grateful, but I don't know really, like, was it, um, what was it? <laughs> so uh, it, oddly enough, it's kind of like a lifetime background thing, which I know sounds incredibly cheesy, but when I was growing up, I, I watched the Sean Connery Bond films with my dad, like little seven-year-old girl, just thought that was the coolest thing. My favorite cartoon growing up was Johnny Quest. My man crush was Ray's Bannon, who was an FBI agent. So this is like an ongoing theme. Um, but when I got into even middle school, I started studying German and did into college. And my first bachelor's degree was actually in German studies. I got a minor in English Lit because I liked it. Um, I did some of a master's in linguistics because I liked that too, but the program wasn't a good fit. And then I came back to MSU, got my MA in English Lit, and I was just looking for a subject area. And I would also say that during my undergrad, I did a curatorial internship at the National Atomic Testing Museum in Las Vegas, which atomic era espionage is, is most of what early James Bond is about. So that fit in. Um, so I, yeah, danke, ganz gut. Uh, yeah, so it's been a, a long thing coming, but when I got into my first MA, I was looking for a subject area. Um, are you going to correct me or are you going to be enjoyable? You can pick one. Uh oh. <laughs> anyway, I got into my first MA and was looking for a subject area to work with. And I was curious about espionage fiction because the Bond films are based off of books, which even when I taught literature, my students looked at me like I had grown a second head when I said the Bond books. And they were like, like, you mean like the novelizations of the movies? And I was like, no, <laughs> no, the, the movie versions of the novels. And they had never even realized. And these were students that were born like after 1995. <laughs> so they wouldn't necessarily know that. Um, mm. And they were shocked and they were like, that's, that's a legitimate thing. And I was like, it definitely is. And I had fallen in love with reading John Le Carre and I, even when I was in middle school, I was reading Anthony Horowitz's Alex Ryder series that my mom got me turned on to. So it was just this long thing. And I was like, is anyone doing anything with espionage fiction like ever? And they were like, uh, no. And in academia, that's what you want. You, you find the thing that no one else is talking about that you jive with, you find natural and that you enjoy. And if you find that. out no one else is doing it, you go, oh, fabulous. That's going to be my thing. And so, and especially because, especially espionage research overall is so male dominated. It's intensely male dominated. I just, it, but it was so natural and so homey for me that it was easy to, to access and, and to meet the parlance. Cause I know a lot of people, it is absolutely very sexist and very racist and orientalist and colonialist and all of these ists. And, and being able to sit in a position where I can recognize that about the genre, still enjoy it, still enjoy myself and be critical of it at the same time was something that was very easy for me in the academic realm. So um, 
Okay. Yeah, so that's how I got into it. It was just this weird serendipitous lead up that literally spanned most of my life. Um, so yeah, good question. It's it's a very weird answer, but okay. oh, I love it. Um, okay, so Jerry has a question that I want to at least address, but I don't. Yeah. I know we don't have time for it. So I think if anything, it's like another entire presentation or panel. So Jerry asks. Can we compare the ethics of sending boys versus sending dogs into dangerous places? And I think the answer is we should talk yeah. about that, but not yeah. tonight. Um, yeah, I will say in short, the one distinction that I'll make is that dogs don't become more aware of their situation as they age dogs only become more traumatized the more that they are in a situation, which is true of humans as well. Now, letting a very young adult, so an 18 year old boy or, or girl, which nowadays is the same, boy or girl sign on unknowingly to that kind of treatment. I know I'm not, I'm not comfy with it either. I find that very questionable. The problem becomes once they have gotten to a certain age, and I don't know what, what that golden age is. I don't know how to determine that on a person by person basis. But I had a friend of mine who went in to the Air Force at age 17. She has served more combat flight hours than anyone I know. She has a presidential medal and she's now discharged medically at the age of 25. She would not have chosen to leave in the last seven years of her life. And I don't have the presumption in my own self to make that decision for her. I, I, and she has questions too. She questions herself about whether joining at 17 was the right decision. And I think parents and children should think about that very hard. But that as an adult, for seven years, she chose to make that decision. And at that point, I cannot tell her that it was the wrong one. All I can do is support. And, and I think this, this goes for dogs and people alike, is to support them and help them as friends, as someone who is coming into ownership of a dog that has been in stressful situations, you need to help treat that dog in a particular way. It's not like other dogs anymore. With people who have gone into those situations, you, by nature being human, deserve to treat them in a way reflective of their experience. And if you are their friend, as I am close friends with this person, that's, that just is a certain level of friendship that I'm willing to take on with this person because I love them. So the ethics of sending them in with dogs, again, dogs don't have the choice. Once they're in it, they can't go. At some point, a human could say no and, and buck the structure. And, and I think that at, at its most nitpicky, most teeny, eeny, weeny, eeny, weeny, 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 weeny nitpicky level, is the only difference between sending in a child versus sending in a dog. The dog doesn't have the choice. At some point, the boy or girl or them could fight the structure and for their rights and have the right to say no. And that is a difference between the two. Good answer. That's, Good answer. that's the best I got. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not justifying either level. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. All uh, right. Uh, so one more question from Steve says, yeah. what do you see for the future of the theme of this topic? What do you, where do you see this going? Yeah, I guess that was kind of where, um, part of why the numbers were so interesting to me was the, the departments that had only gotten shut down in the nineties, but also still seem to be hanging on like at the U S still having more than a hundred marine mammals in its unit was kind of a surprising statistic to me. And we still use dogs 
in in a lot of different areas. Horses make sense when they've been phased out. Pigeons make sense. Um, the eagles again. That was a, that was a twenty first century surprise. So with this topic, I think it's unfinished business. Um, it's a decision that we seem to be trying to phase out to try and not be as abusive of animals as we have been in the past, like militarily or in espionage. But there are some things that we still use them for that we can't or don't have technologies to do for ourselves, which is, which is in and of itself weird and amazing and terrifying. So I think, I think until really the last animal is removed from any kind of, I'll say paramilitary usage. So I'm not, I'm not talking about the dogs at the airport that smell out bombs. I'm talking about the mind sniffing dogs that are still out in war zones in the Middle East right now. Until, until all of that is settled, it's still going to be an open discussion. And that, and that the theme of just the ethics and of the ethics of replacement and the, the economics of replacement are just going to remain a thing to talk about until, until those technologies are developed. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's a little after 7.30, so um, 9.30 for Kelly, so we'll let, we'll let her go. But I just wanted to thank you, Kelly, for being here, for making the time and fitting it into your schedule, um, East Coast. And um, let's see, there's a few reminders. So once I close the event, a survey will pop up, and we would appreciate if you take the time to at least say whether or not you're an OLLI at MSU member that helps us with some of our numbers um, and understanding who's participating. Um, our next Ali at MSU event with the Belgrade Library is two weeks from tonight, same start time, 6 p.m. on April 29th. It's with Dr. Sarah Rushing. She is going to give a talk called The Patient as Citizen, Healthcare, Politics, and Autonomy. And she is an associate professor at MSU right now. Um, so we hope you'll join us for that. The link is through your same MSU um, OLLI registration. And um, my name is Sarah Creech. I'm the adult services librarian at Belgrade Library. If you have any questions about the library or other services we offer, let me know. You can reply to that email I sent with the link and I'd be happy to help you with anything I can. Um, thank you, Kelly, again. And um jerry says nice job of informing entertaining and challenging us cheers so thank you everybody for participating and we hope to see you, you next time all right bye everybody